another gorgeous day in Gresham, isn't it? And it's a good thing that it was sunny today because when I got to work early so I could get a lot done, my computer wouldn't turn on. I'm ready to go back to those, remember those pencil things? They're long with wood and you used to use a knife to whittle down to get to the, I'm ready to do that, although I love my IT guy. He wasn't quite fast enough for me because I wanted it that fast. Isn't it? I'm Lynn Snodgrass, the CEO of the Best Darn Chamber in the entire state of Oregon. I just love being here. I, oh, yeah, Gay Gresham. Um, it just dawned on me that I've been here for almost a year. I will have a birthday celebration, President Allen, in just another month. I can't wait. It's gone so fast. So thank you for coming to the Business and Leaders Luncheon today. I call these the BLTs business and leader talking to each other, and that's what you've been doing, and sure appreciate that. I want to thank the presenting sponsors. As you know, we cannot do this without presenting sponsors. And today, Riverview Bank, thank you very much, Larry. Larry, would you stand up? Let everybody see the great tie you've got on. I love that. Okay. And our other presenting sponsor is Portland General Electric. John, thank you very much for coming, too. John is one of our board members. And we have an education sponsor, the Gresham Barlow School District. I saw a board member here from Gresham Barlow. There we are. Hi. So you can, there we go. You stand up for that, Chris. Thank you for being here. And our media sponsor, Metro East Community Media. Keith Thomas is behind the camera there. And I want to let you know, lots of times people want to see these again because they just can't believe what they heard or they're so excited about what they heard. And Keith has provided us with the, um, with the brochure telling us when the repeat times are going to be. So on your way out, they're on the table out there. Be sure and grab one. And every time you come to a BLT, they're here so that you can replay all the great information you got. We'd also like to recognize any of the elected officials that are in the audience today. I saw a couple of them. We've got one. Oh, you have to stand up. You have to stand up. Lori is here. Kirk's here. Chris is here. Representative Reardon is here. Thank you so much. OK, you, you need to do a little bit better applause on elected officials. Could we just one more good round of applause? All right, thank you. OK, there we go. Remember, they have the purse strings. It's kind of important sometimes. OK. Um, we'd, I personally, but we would also like to recognize the chamber board members that are here today. And um, she is exhausted because she has been telling everybody all of the incredible information, because she can't lobby for it, the incredible information about the Mounted Community College bond. Dr. Durr is here with us today. Dr. Durr, thank you. So is that election coming up anytime soon? From seven, so a week from today is the election, as you know. And uh, I hope that you all will take the time to vote. And that Sue Hughes from Resolutions is here as well. Sue, thank you so much. She did a great job on our bike tourism website. We appreciate that. John Maloney, John, there we go again. Thank you for being a board member. He's on our executive board as well. And now I'm going to reluctantly or happily turn the podium over to the president of the chamber, but before he comes up, he has to promise me that his phone is off. <laughs> See, everybody knows your reputation. I'd like to introduce the president of the chamber, Warner Allen of Warren Allen LLP, the president. Thank you very much. Right before you, right before you, He turned it on airplane mode. <laughs> so we'll see if that works. Thank you very much, President. Good morning, everyone. Still is morning. We got about a half, half a minute left. Um, so Lynn, thank you very much. Uh, our panel today uh, represents the four legs of the stool on a complicated issue of homelessness. Complicated, troubling, uh, fascinating, and, and something that we live with every day. Um, from the city of Gresham, we have Joe Walsh, our city, uh, or our uh, Multnomah County partner, as this is not just a Gresham issue, is uh, Mark Jolin. And of course, our neighbors are impacted from the homeowner's perspective, and we have Terry Shumway. And last but not least, representing our Gresham police is Deputy Chief Robin Sill. 
Each panelist uh, will have five minutes to make a presentation and we'll hold questions until they're finished. And then at that point, we will entertain questions to the panelists. So, Mark, we'll start with you. And then if we can just come down this way, that'd be great. So thank you all for having me. Again, my name is Mark Jolin. My title is Initiative Director for A Home for Everyone. It's a position I've held just a little over a year now. And prior to this, I was the executive director of a nonprofit uh, homeless outreach organization that has a presence in Gresham. It's called JOIN. They do street outreach to folks who are sleeping outside and work with them to try to get back into housing. Um, I'm a trained attorney and have done a variety of legal work in my career. But this work of trying to respond to the crisis of homelessness in our community is something that I've been involved in for more than 20 years now. Um, this is my first time in a role like this where I'm uh, working on the government side to a significant extent. Um, and I'm here because this is both an incredibly um, difficult time for our community around the issue of homelessness in Gresham and in areas throughout Multnomah County. We've seen a real spike in the visibility of the number of people sleeping outside. We have many more tents around. We have not a lot more homeless people in total, but the people who we do have outside are higher need folks. Um, in 2015, in January, we did a, a count, and we do this every two years, of how many people were sleeping outside in shelters and motel rooms in our community. And it wasn't all that different from 2013. It was around 4,000 individuals. Um, but the composition of that population has changed over the last couple of years. For one, a higher percentage of those folks are in the Gresham area, um, of the unsheltered and, and street homeless population. There are more people of color in that community of people experiencing homelessness. And importantly, the percentage of chronically homeless people over since 2007 has grown. And, and the chronically homeless population, those are folks who have been homeless for a year or more, have a significant disability, often multiple disabilities that they're struggling with. It might be mental health, it might be physical health, it might be addiction. But we've seen a very significant increase in that population over the, over the last six years or so in our community. Um, and they tend to be the folks who are most visible on our streets. They tend to be the folks who, when they're living their lives in public spaces, create the most challenges. Um, and so it's partly why we are having this moment right now of, uh, even though the aggregate numbers aren't that different, uh, the experience of the issue is different for us than it has been um, in, in the last years. So I'm here in part because of how serious the crisis is. I'm also here in part because we have an enormous opportunity right now. A Home for Everyone is the most comprehensive and multifaceted partnership of government, all the governments in our region, Gresham, Portland, um, uh, Multnomah County, our housing authority, Home Forward, our many nonprofit partners, our business community, and our faith leaders, the most comprehensive partnership we've ever undertaken in this community to try to address homelessness. We have had plans in the past. Those of you familiar with the 10-year plan to end homelessness have heard that phrase, right? Well, we had one. Uh, it ran its course. We clearly had not ended homelessness. And when we went to bring, our, bring the community back together, we, of course, wanted to learn from what went well under the 10-year plan. And we did many good things. We housed 12,000 people under that plan. <clears throat> but we also wanted to know what we hadn't done so well. Where had we not stepped up in the ways that we needed to? Which communities hadn't we served well enough? What were the missing pieces in our strategies? And one of the learnings from the 10-year plan was that we didn't have a good enough governing structure in place to hold ourselves together at the same table and to hold ourselves accountable to each other for the work that we were getting done. And so a home for everyone, I only have five minutes and I'll, I'll be happy to answer a variety of questions, but in terms of governance, and this is important, for the first time in our community, we have the mayor of the city of Portland, the mayor or a council person from Gresham, the head of Home Forward, the county chair, additional electeds from both the city of Portland and Multnomah County, leaders from the faith community, leaders from the business community, getting together every other month to look at the plan that we have developed, which is a home for everyone, to look at the strategic interventions that we've identified on an annual basis, what are the things that we need to accomplish, and to say, are we making progress? Do we have the resources available? What are the partnerships that we need? How is it going? In other words, they're sitting across the table from each other and really holding each other accountable to the goals that we've set for ourselves. 
with respect to that, we do a lot of really good work in our community through our nonprofit partners and through the faith community and all the folks who are out there on the ground every single day engaging homeless people. Last year in Multnomah County, we helped 3,500 people, 3,500 people move out of homelessness back into permanent housing. That doesn't count the thousands of people we helped to shelter. That's back into permanent housing. But what we know is we're not doing nearly enough of that as a community to see the numbers point in time come down, right? I said we haven't seen a lot of change between 2013 and 2015 and how many people are outside or in shelter on a given night. That's because there are at least as many people becoming homeless as we're helping out of homelessness every year. So if we want to do a better job on homelessness, we need to do one of three things. We need to do a better job of preventing people from becoming homeless in the first place, right? We need to help more people move out of homelessness into permanent housing, right? And we need to help those people who we've helped into permanent housing not fall back. In other words, we need to break this cycle that we see too often where we help someone into housing and then we don't give them enough support on the back end to make sure they don't become homeless again. A home for everyone addresses all three of those strategies. Numerically, 1,350 additional people every year we need to move into permanent housing. That's our initial target in order to start to bring our number down meaningful. We need to prevent 1,000 additional uh, uh, folks from becoming homeless every year. And we need to improve our housing retention rate by 10%. And we've got action plans and strategies geared towards achieving each of those outcomes. There's been discussion about $20 million. My time is up. There's been discussion about $20 million. Those dollars are calibrated very specifically to employment supports, um, uh, health supports, and housing supports to get people in, whether they're coming out of domestic violence, their families, their people of color, their individuals, and chronically homeless people. So that the strategies are there. The work is really hard. But it is work that is only happening and is only going to be successful because we have that table that everybody is at where we're all holding each other accountable, not just government, but government and faith and business, everybody in it together, working against the same plan, working towards the same goals. I think we have a chance right now to make a real difference in this crisis in our community. So I appreciate you having me here and for your commitment to this, and I look forward to answering questions. Okay, I can see the other half of the room now. Um, Joe Walsh, I'm the Senior Manager for Neighborhood Prosperity and Youth Engagement at the City of Gresham. Uh, I oversee our neighborhood programs, our, our gang prevention and intervention uh, initiatives, and I'm the staff uh, point person on homelessness issues. Um, but one thing that we're doing right now at the city is, um, and some of you I know have applied, we had, we had a, a, over 50 applicants for a um, citizen-led task force on homelessness, and we're getting close to narrowing that down and, and sending out announcements of who's going to um, participate on that task force. But the reason we're doing that is because one of the issues that we're having right now as a city is really determining what our role is in this issue. Uh, it's it, it's an it's an issue that might be the most important issue to our residents right now. It's certainly on top of mind. It's in the news every every night. Um, you're seeing it more and more. It's more and more visible, and it's impacting a lot more of our of our residents and our businesses and our neighborhoods. And <clears throat> we're not traditionally a social services provider, <clears throat> but of course we do have a. Um, a responsibility when it comes to public safety, neighborhood livability, and those kinds of things. And so we're really trying to, uh, over the last few years, we've been trying to figure out exactly what our role is, and we're hoping that this task force will help <clears throat> with some of that discussion. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, there's, we've, we've been doing our best with limited resources to implement some new strategies and programs, and kind of, uh, just as we've done with our gang prevention programming, sort of duct tape together some resources and, and, and some um, prevention intervention strategies. And so I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing around homelessness. Um, one exciting new program is through our mediation folks, uh, which is attached to our neighborhood program. It's a, a program called Second Home, which is helping students who are uh, experiencing homelessness, high school students experiencing homelessness, uh, get, connect, uh, get stable housing. Uh, so that they can finish their schooling. So what they do is they partner with a volunteer um, family that's willing to take them in and basically kind of like be a foster home for them for uh, uh, for a year while they finish up school. 
Uh, and then the, how that ties into our mediation program is that the mediation folks sit down with the student and the family to figure out all the rules. As you can imagine, that can be a tricky kind of thing. Do I have to do dishes? Do I have to make my bed, et cetera? So uh, mediation is helping with that. Um, that just launched this school year. Another thing that we've done at the city for the past two years now is we've, um, we, we've contracted with JOIN, where Mark used to work, um, and through that partnership, we have two outreach workers that are basically patrolling all of Gresham uh, and, and East County, looking for those folks experiencing homelessness and helping them get into housing. It's, uh, it's hard work, uh, but they're successful. They've been placing about 10 to 12 people a month into housing. Um, since they've started. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is lately it's actually really slowed down be because of a couple of factors. Um, the uh, rent assistance dollars that they use to help people get into housing really dried up over the past few months. That, that's changed just in the past few weeks, but um, they, they were only able to house something like four people in the last three months because of shortages in rent assistance dollars and the, the really tight rental market. Um, but bigger picture is they're out there, they're connecting with folks out on the streets, they're getting them into services, and they're getting them into housing. <clears throat> um, ending veterans homelessness. Um, this is part of our partnership with A Home for Everyone, and it's not like the city of Gresham is responsible for this, but we um, certainly participated in, in this countywide effort through our work with A Home for Everyone. And, and um, this past year, we officially hit those numbers. And I'll, I'll let Mark talk more about that because he's a lot more uh, versed in what that means to end veterans' homelessness. But, um, but that was a really exciting milestone that, that, uh, we, that we hit. And um, our, our role in that was, and um, Councillor Eccles, uh, as an executive member of the Home for Everyone, helped, along with the other members of that team, reach out to local landlords looking for people who were willing to, help, to um, house, house veterans through this initiative. Um, some of you may have heard us talk over the last couple months about getting some um, new county funding to, to start some new programs. And one of those programs will be having our own internal homeless services specialist. And excited to say that that person has been hired and will start next week. We're really excited to have him on board. And what he's going to do is he's going to help us um, better connect between um, the city, law enforcement, which often comes across the homeless folks out, out along our trail and in our parks, and then all the services that are out there. Um, so we might have him come back sometime because he's. Um, we're really excited to have him on board. He's got a, actually a really interesting personal story, um, one of perseverance, and I'll just kind of tease it at that. Um, <clears throat> he also has a lot of experience in working with homeless populations, including uh, in Salt Lake City, where they've had a lot of success. With that county funding, we're also implementing a new program. I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit to the livability side. Um, I'm sure a big, a big. Uh, what we hear about a lot at the city is the kind of the residue that's left over from um, camps that have been abandoned and, and a lot of the, um, the messes that have happened, particularly along the, the Springwater Trail. And so I know that's really important to our residents and, and how well we can um, clean up after those kinds of, uh, you know, when there's big established camps. And we've had some camps and we've had to hire contractors that cost $20,000 because there was a camp that, that had grown over the course of more than a year. Uh, so what we want to do um, is get better at that and be able to respond quickly so, um, so that those, those issues and, and clothing and you know, we've had car batteries and creeks and things that those don't compound and, um, and cause a lot of environmental damage. So the other piece of the program that we're using with the county funding is called Clean Team and that just launched two weeks ago. Uh, so there's two people out there, somewhere out there right now, driving around in a truck or in a gator and, um, and keeping our parks and trails clean. Uh, picking up after uh, when there's abandoned homeless camps. Uh, the first day they found a couch on the trail and they picked that up. Uh, so it'll really help us get, uh, get better at that piece. And um, as I'm sure you know, back in February we decided to close about 60 acres known as the Gresham Woods along the Springwater Trail for the same kinds of reasons because there had been so much um, environmental degradation in that area that it got to the point where we just had to close it down to all human activity. Um, and uh, not everyone was happy about it, but a lot of, a lot of folks were. And so far, um, it seems to be working. Um, there's not, there's 
virtually no activity out there and, and the environment's starting to heal. Um, and then I'll just end with kind of going back to um, our involvement with the Home for Everyone and just from my perspective, a little bit of good news, bad news. Um, the bad news is this problem really does seem to be getting worse. And again, with the tight, the, the tight rental market, um, that, that, that's contributing to the issue. Um, we're, we're, it's much more visible, and it just seems like it's getting worse and worse. But then the good news is, as Mark was explaining, there's a lot of reason for optimism. There are significant resources coming through um, a home for everyone. I mean, it's almost double the amount of resources that are typically put into this program, in, into this issue, are going to be coming online very soon. And I think we're going to see um, some really positive impacts. Thank you. I'm uh, Terry Shumwave. I'm a resident of the Southwest Neighborhood Association, and um, I got involved in this, well, the last several years I noticed continuing increase in the number of people homeless and along the trails, downtown Gresham, uh, throughout the city. And then I had worked and on the uh, restoration of Turtle Island down the Gresham Japanese Garden, and I hadn't done a lot of work there, but in and out, and one day after thousands of hours of volunteers, I come down and they had, the homeless had taken over, also with some other vandals and kids, but they had just done all kinds of damage. They stole the metals, they tore, the part, tore things apart, and it's like this has become the crown jewel of Gresham, and it's just destroyed overnight. And after a few more things happened, I wrote a letter to the mayor and the city council. Um, the mayor responded and said, um, can we have a meeting with your neighborhood? So the chief and the mayor came and met. There was probably about 40 residents that came, and we had a nice discussion about what could happen. And um, first of all, the police budget was cut to the bone. There wasn't enough money for anything. And this grew from there. We started meeting. I started meeting with the churches. I met Joe Welch at that point, And I spent the next probably nine months going to the Gresham Homeless Action Team meetings. I met a lot of the providers and saw what was going on in the community with this. And while it was all good, I felt the voice of the neighborhood and the impact on us was not being either understood or heard. And I got a few remarks that I'm not in my backyarder, which, yeah, I guess I am, but I don't think anyone at this room would like to live with what was going on on the trail at that time and the crime, the all the things. There's so much going on. And so one by one, we just started taking on these issues at a little bit at a time. And um, I got... I wanted to hear answers outside our community, so I have gone to, I've met with just about every political um, leader in our, from uh, Ron Wyden's office on down to Carla, um, Diane McKeel. I've met with everybody looking for some answers, and um, everybody understands it's a big problem, but I haven't heard a lot of really things that are gonna happen right this moment. So. Um, so I went outside the community. I met with Israel Bale, who's Bayer, who's in charge of street routes and done a tremendous job there. Um, Jeff Woodard, he's Woodward. He's involved in a lot of different things as far as dealing with the homeless. I met with some of the people that I consider the experts in dealing with it. And the common thing I got was um, from these people, tent camping is not the answer. Um, it, you've got to have housing first and that came from the guy in Salt Lake City and also I've heard that from people in Denver I've heard it from all across the country that without getting people into housing of some kind shelter you're not going to be able to deal with the issues and it seems like some of the things that happen is they want to deal with well you can come in if you're not doing drugs or you're not drinking but then so they don't come in and so while you can't mix all these people together, I think when you're working with a plan for the money, one of the things that needs to be addressed is to have housing opportunities available for just about all kinds. And if that means letting all the drunks and the druggies together in one place until you can sort through them, I don't know that we're going to get this problem solved. Um, my concerns right now in the next, by the end of the month, we're losing the Joyce Hotel is 90 beds. 
Menashe is another 100, and the Sears Armory is another 150, all in Portland. And where are those people going to go? It's the same thing with the Springwater Trail. Um, so we need some, we have some immediate needs for some things like right now. And we don't want to go through another summer of terror on the Springwater Trail. Um, the destruction of public resources is just unbelievable. And um, we, and this was Metro, to spend the amount of money we do for open spaces and that the public can't even go there, that's just not acceptable. And I hope everyone understands that and agrees with me on that. Um, we're also, just, um, we have a huge bicycling community. I'm part of that. And I have many of them want, not want to come to East County anymore. Well, now they're saying, well, if we can get to Gresham without going through Portland, we're coming. So anyway, that's kind of what we need to work on on those issues. So he said my time. Oh, time's up. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. I, I have to apologize. I don't have a voice. So I mean, I have a voice, but I don't have a voice. So my name is Robin Sells, and I'm the deputy chief here at uh, Gresham Police Department. And just to give you a little background of um, how I came to this position, I was tw I was a police officer for 29 years in California, and I got asked to come up here last year for a one-year job as a deputy chief. And um, with the retirement of Chief Jenniker, the city asked me to stay um, another year, which was okay with me because, to be honest, I, I actually fell in love with this place, so I'm okay. <laughs> um, but I only tell you that just so that you have a little history, or so that you know that I don't have the history of Gresham like some of these other people that are up here on the on the panel. But I will tell you, in the last year, in the year that I have been here, I've seen a tremendous change. While we had homeless issues in California, they were not to the level that I've seen here in Gresham. But I do feel we are making progress. Um, we have our net team, which has been significant in the reduction of the problems on the Springwater Trail. And just so you know, when they come across a camp, they can't just tear this camp down and send the people packing. There are federal laws that say that homeless people are a protected class, and we are required to honor that. So unless there is a crime being committed there, we have to leave them stay there if they're on public lands. And I know that's really troublesome to a lot of you, and I, I feel your pain, I really do, I, I, it's frustrating. Um, I was out in the field yesterday, I rode with an officer all day, and we went to a, a camp over off of um, Wallula, and while it's not on the Springwater Trail, you would be amazed at how organized this camp is. They not only have um, certain areas that they live in, in this back area, they, they've uh, elected their own mayor, um, they have an assistant mayor, and they have a pantry that would make a lot of us um, just jealous. They're very, very organized. And they know the point that we can take them to. They keep their camp clean. There was um, no human waste there. There's no needles. And they know there's nothing we can do. So to that end, um, you know, I, I ask your patience with us. But I, I do feel along the Springwater Trail, we have made an incredible difference. It's important to us as the police department. And now that I'm the interim chief, I, I really want to make sure that I um, honor your public safety on that trail. So we have committed um, to allowing our officers on overtime to be out there on the gator. And I think maybe some of you might have seen them. In the time that the gators, gator patrol, and sadly, these officers are on overtime because I don't have the resources to pull them off of the regular uh, districts. They have to do this on an overtime basis. So I have to have watch two to make sure they don't get burnt out as well. Although I wish I could work that detail. You know, riding around the gator out in the sun, that would be kind of a lot more fun than what I do sometimes. But in the time that the gator has been out there, um, I, I got a report for them last week that there was not one camp on the Springwater Trail. And I think that is an incredible accomplishment from what we first started with. Now, on Monday, I heard there's a couple more camps that have sprung up just over the weekend. So we're back at it, and we're not going to give up. And, and we, we hear your concerns. I promise you we do. And we want to make sure that that trail is safe for all of you to be out there. But I think the key to the homeless issue that we're dealing with, we can't arrest ourselves out of it. It would be nice if we could go out there and arrest everybody and get them off the trail, but that's not the answer. Um, not only that, even if we could, the county has lost um, in their upcoming budget 115 beds in the jail. That's, that's a huge impact. So they're not going to be taking the petty uh, crimes. They're just going to give them citations and send them on their way. Yesterday when I was in that camp that I referred to earlier, there was a gentleman there, and I just had a conversation with him. You know, why, why are you here? Why don't you get out and get a job? And he says, I am trying to better myself. I'm going to college, and um, 
I, I leave the camp every day. I, I ride my bike over to Multnomah, or, uh, Mount Hood College, and I, I'm taking some classes. And he says, but he got kicked out of a class because his hygiene was so poor that the other students complained. And he smelled so bad they didn't want to sit next to him. So here's this man trying to better himself, but he can't because he doesn't have the resources to have a place to take a shower. So I, I implore you that it's not a police issue. It really is a services issue. And we need to make sure that we help these people in other ways. Oh, I'm getting the boot up back there. <laughs> uh, that we really need to make sure that they have the services and not just leave them out there to fend for themselves. And while I appreciate the fact that a lot of uh, the, the local churches are giving food to these people. When I was at that camp yesterday, they were literally throwing away rotten food because they had such an abundance of the food. So we're not necessarily helping them by doing that. We're, we're enabling them to just rely on us for their services. So hopefully, um, I, I've been able to give you a little bit of what we're dealing with from the police department, and I'll be happy to answer any questions when we get to the panel. So thank you. Time for questions. Um, who would have a question? The sounds coming from the. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. The people next door. There's a there's a meeting next door, unfortunately. Good afternoon. Thanks for showing up for this uh, very current topic. I have a, um, an observation and a question. It is very important that we meet the needs of the homeless in our community, but it's also equally important, as the city council has already, as councilors have acknowledged, this is not a city issue. This has to be a community. We as a businesses, we as the community, need to reach out and, and service this need, which is happening here. But I, I have one question. Do we have a mechanism in place so that as we develop these great service programs and as we find housing for everyone, that we're not becoming a magnet city for additional homeless that, that say, for example, maybe El Paso, that does not have as good of services as we're providing, all of a sudden we become attractive to the homeless there, and now we're overburdening our own community with those that aren't even from here? Whoever wants to take that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this, this is a, a common question, it's a concern, and honestly, I think it's a concern in every city. Uh, when Lloyd Pendleton, who led the effort in Salt Lake City, was asked this question at the city club, he said, you know, he had the same conversation in Salt Lake, right? There's a percentage of people in the homeless population who are not originally from your community, but that is true in every every city up and down the West Coast. Um, what we know, when we, when we ask people, and we do in our point in time count, that, that survey that I described, we ask, how long have you been in Multnomah County? And the folks who've, of the people who've been here just in the last couple of years, we ask them, well, when you came here, were you homeless? And something like 12% of the people say, yes, they were actually homeless when they got here. And then we say, well, if you were homeless when you got here, why did you come here? And of those people, only about 13% identify services as one of the reasons they came here. So when you take the total population of 2,000 people sleeping outside or in shelter, the number of people who actually came here homeless and came here homeless for services is really, really small. The vast majority of people who came here from somewhere else didn't come homeless, but they came here poor, didn't have a lot going, but were looking for a new life. They had friends and family here. They thought they had a job here. And they got here, and it didn't work out. And they found themselves homeless because they didn't have a support network here. Um, and of those folks who were homeless when they got here, even they mostly came here because they had a friend who told them they could live with them. They had a job they thought was lined up for them. They got here, and it didn't happen. One of the reasons, and this has gotten some attention in the press, one of the reasons we created a formal program recently to help folks who are stranded here get back to the communities where they have a support network is just that, because we know our providers were saying to us, we've got all these people who came to Portland thinking something that was going to happen for them, or from Multnomah County, thinking something was going to happen for them that didn't, and now they're stranded here. 
but they've got a family member in South Carolina who says they can stay with them. We just don't have any resources to help them get there. So these transportation assistance programs that are often framed in the press as give everybody a bus ticket to get them out of the town so you solve the problem that way, make it somebody else's problem. None of them are structured that way, not San Francisco's, not ours. They're about helping people who have landed here, thought they had something going and don't, if they've got a better option. Because right now, if you show up looking for shelter in Multnomah County as a single male person, you can expect to wait three to four months to get a shelter bed. So if you came here thinking this was the land of riches in terms of services, you're very quickly going to find out that's not the case. And if you've got a better option someplace else, we want to help you get to that. A related question, so you might as well stay up there for us. Um, although it may go more to the panel at large, I'm not concerned about people in El Paso, Texas, who are homeless finding their way to Portland, Oregon, because we've got showers. That kind of thing doesn't happen. But lines are relatively arbitrary on a map, and how are we dealing with this regionally? Yep. I mean, Multnomah County, great. From Oregon City into Multnomah County is a much more reasonable place to go for a shower. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing that Multnomah and, and Clackamas and Washington County need to work on regionally. What's that look like? That, that is a very fair question and concern. Um, and it's very much a topic of conversation. So there's both a discussion about the sort of regional responsibility around creating housing options for very low income people, right? Because as we've said, this we can't end homelessness or for anyone if we can't find housing, right? There are a lot of other things we need as well, but you don't end homelessness if someone doesn't get a home. Um, and so there's a regional conversation about that, and Metro has started to provide some leadership around calling that question for the community. And then there's a kind of services, I call it a services equity question, right? So if we need a certain amount of shelter in our community, does it all need to be in Multnomah County, or does some of it exist in Washington County, does some of it exist in Clark County? We're in the very infancy of those, of those conversations. Um, it's actually interesting, the Spring Water Corridor is the first time because uh, the city and county and, and Gresham are working through Oregon solutions to, to try to address the Spring Water Corridor in a truly sort of interjurisdictional, intergovernmental way, and it's gonna bring Clackamas, Multnomah, Gresham, Portland to the table, both on the public safety side and on the services side. So it, it, so I'm hopeful that that becomes a demonstration of what can be done as a, as a more regional response to the issue. That said, we've got a long way to go in figuring out how to have that conversation because it's not obvious how you get people to the table uh, to, to sort of own responsibility for some of that, that resource sharing. So I don't have a perfect answer for you other than to say that we're, we are looking at it and trying to find those opportunities. I have a question and maybe you could come back to the table. <laughs> I don't know if it'll affect if this is. So um, I have a business at Gresham in downtown Gresham and now I'm starting to have uh, people come into the they want to use the restroom, and when they leave, they've used it as a shower. Um, I know there's ways that we can have keys and do all this. I see a lot of mentally ill people, and what part of this homelessness, I mean, obviously mentally ill people are on drugs. Um, I had a family member who has since passed who was mentally ill. One of the things that David always said to me is, um, they were afraid to go into places. They, If you're mentally ill, you don't, you're not making a right decision. So yes, they do drugs and whatever, but a lot of that starts with mental illness. Do we have any support for the mentally ill who are walking up and down the path, uh, not on their psychotic medicines, whatever? I mean, we can address a lot of things, but we have never addressed mental illness in this state. We have not. And I've been there, been through it a lot with families, so I know that. So what part of that can we do to help that part? So it is a big, part of the, the challenge we're facing of the folks we survey in the street count who are sleeping unsheltered half self-identify as having addiction and mental health issue, right? So it's a really pervasive part of the experience that folks are having out there. And, um, and we have, as a community, done a very poor job, right? We, we have grand ambitions around not institutionalizing people and, and, and limiting their, their freedom to be part of the community, which is the right 
which is, is the right thing to want to do. And as a community, we have never stepped up on the back end and said, if these folks are not going to be in institutions, they're going to be out in our community, then we have to have enough community-based supports, both housing supports and social service supports, to actually allow them to successfully integrate into the community. We did the deinstitutionalization part, and we did continue to do it in various ways, um, in part driven by, by what the law tells us, and in part by the way that we think we should be as a community. We have never really delivered on the other half of that promise, and the victims in that are the people who are mentally ill and are left without resource. Our challenges uh, on this, in part, uh, come from the restrictions that government has on involuntarily hospitalizing people, right? And so many people who we all know need care, and it's demonstrable if they're not an immediate threat to themselves or others, like immediate now threat in the short term, and, and the police deal with this all the time. There's very little anyone can do. We cannot make them go. And even if we can make somebody go to the hospital temporarily, chances are they're going to be back out. The opportunity we have in this regard is to expand our capacity of trained outreach workers who have mental health skills. And we're doing that with these new Home for Everyone investments in the city of Portland. They created a new intensive street engagement team that is staffed by Cascadia Behavioral Health Care. So we can get more people with mental health skills out into the field to do better engagement with those folks. It was mentioned that our shelter system I would describe it as high barrier. So we have good shelter for people who are prepared to be clean and sober and fully engaged in case management. We have not publicly funded shelter that I would describe as low barrier, where someone can come in, whether they're using or still in their you know, uh, untreated mental health circumstance, their animals, their partners. There are communities that have shelter like that. And I didn't talk about shelter in my comments, but we're going to invest a significant amount of money in expanded shelter capacity that is low barrier so that we can offer some of those folks who are struggling a safe place to be at night so they're not out on the spring water corridor. And then finally, the Affordable Care Act is an opportunity. Many, many of these folks now either can have or do have insurance. And we are slowly building our provider capacity up through the Medicaid expansion to actually be able to offer some of these folks treatment who historically we have not been able to offer treatment to. So there is some hope out there, and there are some things we can do, but it is a huge part of the problem. So um, on a follow-up question on the mental health issues, um, have you folks been connecting with the Unity Center and the new development there, and could you comment about that? Yeah, so that, that's another opportunity I should have mentioned. The Unity Center, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a consortium of hospitals have come together, and rather than providing mental health intake through the ERs that they each run, uh, where often you don't have a mental health professional doing the initial engagement with the person you have a, a general ER doc, They've come together and, and consolidated those services into a new center called the Unity Center that's in inner northeast Portland. It will open in the fall. And it is a specialized emergency uh, service center for people in mental health crisis. And it will have both a very short term kind of 24 hour uh, assessment and intake and care center. And then it'll have 100 beds of slightly longer term uh, options for folks to, to stay who are, are stabilizing and getting into care. So having the center is, is going to be a huge benefit. I was talking to somebody who herself had gone through mental health crisis, and she was sharing with me the experience she'd had of going to the ER and being treated by a general ER doc who meant well, but truly did not understand the, what the depression she was experiencing meant for her and how vulnerable she was, and that her coming to the hospital was an enormous opportunity to connect her to the supports that she really needed, and instead, they spent a little bit of time with her and put her back out on the street, and it took years before she got back and was ready to, to talk to somebody again about her mental health condition. The Unity Center hopefully does a better job of that, that when someone is in crisis and they come into care, even in that moment, they get exactly the kind of professionalized assistance they need. And then Multnomah County is working really hard because those are short-term interventions. So Multnomah County is looking very hard at their existing array of mental health services, making sure that they're attached to the people who are coming out of Unity. And on our end, on the housing side, we're looking at making sure that we're not just cycling these folks, many of whom will be homeless, into Unity and then back out and losing the opportunity that we have to engage them both in care and in a more stable housing environment because, as was said earlier, with with 
supportive housing, we know that the only way to really break the cycle is to get people into permanent housing and give them the support services they need there to be successful. So we're looking at Unity both as itself a very good opportunity and an important way to better organize our services community-wide. This is most likely for Deputy Sells. As citizens, what are some of the best ways we can work with the police to uh, alert you to issues, to keep ourselves safe, and to continue to respect the rights of the homeless people? Sure. <clears throat> you know, I think the best thing you can do is if you do see a camp, feel free to call us. And our net team, although they might not get to it that day, they will get to it as soon as they can. And let us go out there and see if it, it qualifies to get the camp to move along. But we take any and all information that you give us um, because at the end of the day, we want you to be safe. We want you to have that comfort level within the community. So please call us at, you know, you've got our numbers, we'll, you know, we'll respond. So it's just you're our eyes and ears because we can't be out there 24 seven. And, um, you know, the, even the Gator Patrol on the Spring Water Trail is only out there for uh, like six hours a day. So I want to make sure that you, everybody feels free to give us a call and, and we will respond. Could I add something to what she said? Of course. I want to say. Go ahead and step up to the microphone. Oh, okay. That's what we're reporting. <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, recognize the Gresham Police Department, and I cannot tell you how responsive they've been in the last couple of years and what an incredible difference they've made on the trail. And they came through, jumped through some kind of hoops this year to clean up the trail and make it safe for everyone. The gator, the police on it are so friendly and helpful to the community. And one thing that I was disappointed to see in the city budget that the police um, money was not increased this year, but I think we as a community need to fully support our Gresham Police Department and do all we can to find them the resources to continue their job. And I hope she'll stay on for a long time, but I know she doesn't want to. But um, I just want to acknowledge that for her. I just wanted to ask the panel, um, homelessness is a huge issue. It's been here for years. It's not going away anytime soon. Um, it, but it seems like we, we have this patchwork effort, and it sounds like some things are coming together and so forth, but how about the concept of back when I was a kid, um, the Edgefield Manor, it was the poor farm, and they had cattle, they had livestock, they had veg vegetable gardens. And my understanding, it was pretty much self-sustaining. I mean, how about big picture? that the community supports a concept such as that, offers permanent housing, they have to um, earn or keep a little bit, if you will, and um, it, I think it would put a substantial dent in the long-term problem. I don't want to hog the floor, but I have a comment to make on that. <laughs> Um, last night I went to this meeting at the Kennedy School and Sean Davis um, was there with a bunch of speakers and they have an amazing plan they're working on. I don't know where it's going to go but they talk, there's been a lot of talk about using Wapato for a shelter or any similar thing and they're addressing every single thing you said and it's more of a peer managed program and if you're interested get a hold of him seandavis.com or see me and I'll get you some information on it well they're going beyond this and I'm sorry but they've got some they've got answers to some of the problems or reasons that they said it couldn't happen so I would encourage anybody that's interested in that to pursue him or let me know and I'll get you the information So I'll just add the, the Wapato piece of it is a long conversation. Um, but I think the idea, there are some models around the country in San Antonio and elsewhere where folks have really looked to develop a campus that has an integrated array of services. It feels patchwork here sometimes, but if, if you kind of draw it out, there's actually quite a bit of organization to how different nonprofits engage in the work and collaborate in the work. So even if we don't have a single campus, we have an increasingly coordinated system of services to make sure that we're not duplicating, that we're putting the right team of people around each of the folks that we're engaging. That said, there continues to be discussion about what the advantage would be of a large type of facility where you could have on the same site your shelter services, an array of nonprofit delivered services, maybe even housing they do in San Antonio. So I don't think anyone that I'm aware of, certainly in the home for everyone, 
collaboration is, is even if Wapato isn't a great option for where to do it, is taking the idea of a more large campus off the table. There are other potential sites you could do that that would be closer in and, and better integrated into the larger community than Wapato is. But that idea is definitely something that folks are exploring. It, not in the poor farm exactly, but this idea of a, of a, you know, you have job training and all kinds of other services on site too. So if housing is one of the principal issues uh, to cure homelessness uh, by definition, um, what steps are being taken to increase the um, available housing units? <laughs> or find, right now, you know, I've, find I've, new ones? I've same as I don't want to look at mine. Um, so on the, on the housing front, there are a number of things happening. Um, so th there are a variety of tools, and I have to confess, and, and Joe can probably talk more to Gresham, the, what tools you have or are using here. But certainly in, in Portland, there's a lot of work going on on expanding the, the different types of tools and incentives to, in particular, get the private development community more involved in producing housing that, that we can make affordable to very low-income people. And that really is our principal challenge, right, is that we have a very large population of people who make 30% of the area median income or below. And as a reference point, that's basically full-time minimum wage or below. Um, those are folks on long-term disability. Those are folks who are working minimum wage jobs. We're short something like 40,000 units of housing in our, in our county that was uh, rents at a level that's affordable to those folks. Those folks aren't all outside. Many of them are living in apartments where they're spending 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 percent of their income on rent. So one strategy is to get the private development community more involved in a number of different ways. You've probably followed the inclusionary zoning discussion in Portland. They're trying to figure out how to implement, implement that. Uh, that would actually require some set aside of affordable units on all private developments of a certain scale. There is an effort to raise more money to put into affordable housing. So there's discussion right now about a community-wide bond that would uh, address some of the unmet need for affordable housing supply. Um, and the city of Portland has, has upped their investments through tax increment financing and other vehicles into the affordable housing portfolio. So the city's housing bureau, Portland's housing bureau, just issued commitments for some 500 or so additional units to be built out over the next several years. But but we really need all strategies. There are also discussions about how do we use ADUs and non-traditional housing options, tiny houses that can be less expensive to build, easier to locate. Trying to address the code and land use concerns around those things is a, is a real issue, but we're also looking at that. So uh, it's very much on everybody's mind, and uh, all options are on the table right now because the crisis is so significant. Do you want to add? Um, just a couple quick things. Um, e despite the housing crisis, Gresham still continues to be one of the most affordable places in the region. So it's really a regional discussion. So it's it's good that these discussions are happening on a regional level because I think there's certainly a lot of other communities that aren't necessarily um, doing their share in providing affordable places for folks. Um, but uh, then the only other thing I would add is that um, updating our, our housing policy is um, part of the council work plan for this year, so staff are working on that now. So I guess I'm a little confused on where the homeless are going when they're being moved out of now Portland. Um, I live on Springwater Trail in Johnson Creek, and so I, every day, Recently, actually, I, there has not been camps um, that I can see, um, which is amazing to me because I thought for sure the minute Gresham Woods got closed down, they were going to come east and, you know, I'd see all these camps. I did not. I also did not see the camps when um, Portland booted them all out. So where are they going is my first question. Um, my second question is, what really are, I'm confused about the rules around them camping. I know that they're allowed to camp in public places, but, but when I do call, you know, they do, you guys come out and within a nice amount of time. So I'm just kind of confused about it all. And I must say, as a final note, I'm, on a negative standpoint, I feel I'm really confused about today because I have what I read in the, in the papers about what's going on. Um, 
and then I, I have what I see <laughs> in my community that I've been in for over 30 years, and, and now what you are saying. So I don't quite know what to believe. Got it. Um, your first question, where are they going? Um, I'm not really sure, but I know it's not coming into Gresham. And I know that because our net team, our community resources team, actually walked the trail um, uh, last week. They walked from one end to the other, the whole Gresham Trail. And there was none of the people. And it was the day that Portland was doing the sweeps. So my only thought is that they're moving further into Portland. I know Portland is offering a, um, there's a five acre parcel somewhere on Foster Road, and I don't remember the cross street. And that is supposed to be an area that they're trying to move people to, that they're going to have uh, porta potties and, and showers and offer services. So some of them may be headed that way. But to be honest, I don't know where they're at, but they're not here. Um, second question is, um, how do you know if a camp is legal or not? And we have to go by, we're looking for somebody that is um, violating the law. Mostly has to do with biohaz and um, human waste. So if there's human waste at, at the camp itself, that's obviously a danger to the public. And that's when we can close down a camp. If they are doing their personal business outside of that camp, the, and the camp is clean, which is what we are finding, then there's nothing we can do. They're on public land, their, tent, their tent's clean, and we just you know, talk to them and move on. Um, if there's needles or any other type of illegal activity, then we take action as far as that goes, and that allows us to shut down the camp. So it has to be a, a significant violation or a bio, biohaz type situation. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Reardon, state rep for District 48, which is uh, uh, partly in Lentz area. So I, I came here today, I wanted to listen, but I have to comment because I know where they're at. Um, so we, you heard a lot about the uh, uh, clearing out Spring Water Corridor from Cartlandia West. And uh, I rode my bike out. They did a fantastic job. It, it looks great. So the uh, cart owners at Cartlandia are much happier. But if you drive east across 82nd and drive out, or not drive, ride out along Spring Water Corridor, um, there's a large number of folks that relocated out there. I just did this ride yesterday. Um, so, um, and they go beyond 122nd, I'm trying to think how far I rode, beyond 136th. And I turned around and came back. So we're doing a great job cleaning up things on the Gresham end, great on the Portland end, uh, but they all love Lentz. So um, that's the issue that I'm dealing with. Uh, a couple of things I want to mention that going on. I'm going to have a, a bicycle town hall, 9 o'clock Saturday morning, rain or shine. And it'll start at the Lentz floodplain restoration area about 104th and Foster Road. And then I will be on the um, Springwater Corridor Oregon Solutions Task Force. And I think, Mark, you're on that as well, right? So that's just starting this week, but it's to take kind of a regional look at the issues that we're facing. And it is, obviously, by what I just said, it's a regional issue because we can't just squeeze on one end of the trail and uh, not expect to see results elsewhere. So uh, we'll be happy to have anybody uh, join us. There'll be um, half a dozen legislators that will be there. I don't know how many other people, hopefully not too few or not too many. But um, anyway, so we're trying to find out what's going on. It's just a crisis. I'm really concerned about what's going to happen this summer. And I think we need to start acting with greater urgency. That would be my only take on this. Time for one last question. Um, I work with Meals on Wheels. And I know that there are a lot of different um, faith communities and nonprofits that are both here at this meeting, but that also work every day to help the public in general. And I at least in what I have seen, that is increasingly um, a homeless population. Um, I think we all got into this work to try to help save the world and to do good things. And that's a genuine, nobody does it without that. However, at the same time, I think after you've done it for a while, you do start to wonder if at some point you're enabling. And I guess my question to you would be, what, what do you envision from your standpoint as the line. What are we doing that's genuinely helpful, and what are we doing that perhaps isn't? The 
only thing I can go on is my experience and what I've seen actually out there in the field. And it was such an eye opener yesterday when I saw the abundance of food that those people had out there. I'm not kidding, it, it was an incredible pantry. And so that just tells me that they're abusing the system. I don't know what that line is. And I think at some point in time, maybe you have to limit the number of times that they come to your facility and tell them that they need to go out and you know work for themselves and try and sustain what they can. If they know they can always come to um, a certain church or Meals on Wheels or, or some place and get food, there's no incentive for them to try and go out and better themselves. There really is not. So I, I would maybe limit what they can get but on the other hand, you want to be compassionate as well. So you have to find that fine line within your own organization. So. I, there isn't a simple answer to that question, of course, but I, there's no, on the one hand, I think we, we as a community have to be accountable for offering services that actually meet the needs of the people we face. And often when we hear that someone is service resistant or someone is not wanting to participate or wanting to better themselves because we've offered them something and they didn't take it, or they right? Um, what, what's really going on there is that what we're offering, we haven't given enough thought to whether that is really gonna work for them in that moment. So shelter's a great example. And, and we have a lot of you know, shelter and we'll go out and we'll say, hey, I've got a shelter bed for you. Do you wanna take it? And very often someone will say no, not because they don't wanna improve their lives or, or get back into housing, but because they would have to leave their pet or their partner or all of their stuff or whatever it is, or they'd have to be sober and they're not and they'll just get thrown out. But once we've gone through that process of assessing sort of what is the service package that we're offering, at some point there's accountability then, right? And whether it's the camping activity on our corridor or and you know anything that is criminal activity, assaultive behavior, not a homelessness issue. That's just assaultive behavior and, and we need the police and service providers to partner around that. Um, but you know, once we've done the work of kind of coming to people with the services that we that are the best we can do to, to help them, then there is accountability around how they use those services, how they engage. And you know, if someone says, I, don't, I still don't want it, okay, there's not much more I can do for you other than to put some limits on the impact you're having out there. So I, that, that's kind of how I come at that work. There's both a responsibility we have as a community and there's definitely a responsibility that the folks we're trying to help have. And we gotta be, be in that dialogue all the time. Thank you all, panel, very much. Um, this is uh, an interesting and troubling issue, uh, one that uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we're talking about it uh, in this forum. And um, thank you all for, for coming and sharing your insights. Um, <laughs> thank you again also to our sponsors, Riverview Community Bank, um, Portland General Electric, and Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media. Um, once again, don't forget to pick up uh, one of the little flyers um, if you want to review what was said here uh, and the questions and answers. Um, those flyers, again, are on the table as you go out the door. Um, at your tables, you have uh, evaluation sheets. We really appreciate you filling those out. It gives us a lot of feedback about what you want to uh, see in the future what went right and what maybe didn't go right uh, this afternoon and we uh, we really treasure the opportunity to get that feedback and it makes a big difference in how we conduct our our forums um, with that thank you again everyone for attending and go out and enjoy this sunshine <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>